Uh, so good evening, uh, respected faculty members, and to all our uh, participants joining us this evening through our YouTube channel. A very warm welcome to you all to the fourth webinar series from the team uh, NephroCon. Well, due to some inherent uh, Zoom platform glitches, we are today live through our YouTube channel. And you all are encouraged to actively participate in the discussions and share your thoughts in the live YouTube chat box. And we'll take all the questions at the end. Uh, the theme for today's webinar is uh, membranous nephropathy. And we are thankful to our distinguished speaker and esteemed panelists who have generously shared their time and knowledge to make this event possible. So I think without any further delay, let's kickstart today's webinar. And I would like to welcome and invite uh, our speaker, Dr. Alok Sharma, sir who's the head of department uh, renal pathology and electron microscopy at Dr. Lalpat Labs, New Delhi. And he'll be speaking on antigens of membranous nephropathy trending in India. Over to you, sir. So very good evening to all. And uh, thanks a lot to the Nephrocon team for inviting me to talk about a subject which I very passionately follow. So uh, I'll be speaking about the target antigens in membranous uh, nephropathy today. And uh, what I'll do is I'll just start with a brief uh, background of membranous nephropathy for those who probably are not well versed in renal pathology. And then we'll unfold the various antigens and, and what is the current situation in India is a we compare to the world. And we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see how it progresses from there. So to begin with, uh, uh, membranous nephropathy or some people call it membranous glomerular nephritis also. Although I, I really don't agree with that nephritis term because it's predominantly not a proliferative uh, disease. It's better to call it a membranous glomerulopathy. So it is defined by presence of a subepithelial immune complexes. And what happens is these subepithelial immune complexes, when they get deposited in the glomerular basement membrane, they induce a spectrum of changes in the GBM. And morphologically, we identify those changes and diagnose a membranous pattern of injury. So remember, in renal pathology, everything is pattern-based approach. So it's a membranous nephropathy is a membranous pattern of disease, which is induced by deposition of subepithelially located uh, immune complex deposits in GBM. So immune complexes are basically nothing but uh, aggregates of antigens and antibodies. And in vast majority of, in fact, all the cases, the Antigen is basically a antigen which is planted within the GB in the podocyte food process. It's a podocytic antigen. And the circulating autoantibodies, which are specific to that particular antigen, go and bind to it and form an immune complex, which we appear and see as humps in uh, the subepithelial deposits in EM or as mottling or spikes in LM, as the case may be. And uh, all of us know that it is the most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in adults. So when we look at the light microscopy of uh, membranous glomerulopathy, there is a wide variation. So that is why it is so sometimes very difficult to diagnose even on light microscopy and immunofluorescence also sometimes because the glomeruli actually may appear normal in a large number of cases. And as the disease progresses, the characteristic appearance of these deposits uh, makes the diagnosis much easier. Uh, and as the disease progresses, not only the glomerulus, it also induces changes, the accompanying changes in the tubules and the incision. So if you look at a disease which has progressed beyond a certain stage or the advanced stages of membranous GM, you will see a lot of glomerular scarring, tubular interstitial scarring along with it. So it's a progressive disease which is induced by an antigen-antibody complex mediated process. So this is just an image which tells you the various morphological patterns and uh, the pass and the syrup. So in renal pathology, what we do is keep the stains, which are actually special in other branches, are a routine in renal pathology. So we routinely use PAS stain, the silver methanamine stain, the mason strachrome stain, the Congo red stain as a routine for each and every biopsy. And this is what helps us to identify a lot of diseases per se. For example, in membranous glomerulopathy, if the deposits are... Uh, enough in number, they will induce changes which we call as mottling or spikes, which helps us to identify the pattern of injury. <clears throat> now, DIF is critical to diagnose membranous GN. And uh, what happens in membranous GN is the immune complexes are predominantly of the IgG. The antibodies are of predominantly IgG type. So IgG staining is very bright in IF. And if you look at the subclasses of IgG, there are four subclasses of IgG. And IgG4 is the most common component of these immune complex deposits. So you have a planted antigen, then you have 
outer antibodies towards it. They form together to form immune complexes, and these immune complexes are composed predominantly of the antibodies are predominantly IgG. And it is important to note here that in about 80 to 85 percent of cases, you also get a significant staining for C3 along with IgG. So in renal pathology, in routine, we use a, a routine panel of at least seven antibodies. So that is IgA, IgG, IgM, C3, C1Q, and both the light chains, the kappa and lambda. So in most of the cases, you would also get a C3 staining along with IgG. But there are certain cases where you don't get C3 staining and, and we'll come to that as we talk about the various antigens there. So you, they, a note is to be made of the various staining patterns. And uh, in some one subset of cases, the so-called few secondary MGNs, you may also get staining for other immune reactants, including IgA, IgM, and even C1Q in some cases. So we'll, we'll talk about these cases as we go on further in this lecture. So these are a few images of typical pattern of uh, IgG staining in direct, direct immunofluorescence. And all these appear green because the adjuvant, the fluorosin, the fluorescent compound which we use is FITC, which is the fluorescent isothiocyanate and it fluoresces bright green when you incident a blue light on it. And you can nicely see the fine granular staining along the GBMs, which is characteristic for a membranous gene. Having said that, there are certain subtypes or certain membranous GN which do not show a very bright staining here. And the staining at best can be called segmental. And uh, corresponding to that, the even the deposition of immune complexes is only segmental in these cases. So we call these cases as segmental MGN. And they have a unique antigenic profile as we will see in the coming uh, slides. <clears throat> Now, a um, uh, few of you may have heard that uh, we actually stage membranous GN also. So the membranous GN, based on its ultrastructural appearance, is staged into four stages. And what these stages basically denote is the progression of the disease. So starting from the earliest stage one, where the deposits are very scant, to the more prevalent ones in stage two. In stage three, the deposit starts getting reabsorbed. And in stage four, apart from the resorption, you also get a lot of remodeling of the GVM. So basically what it denotes is the disease progression. And apart from this, it really does not have a very significant clinical correlate or outcome. So you can't really make much out of a clinical uh, uh, nature of the disease, apart from saying that the disease itself has, the glomerular deposits and themselves have become old. The reason I'm telling you here is because even when you have a stage three or even a stage four appearing glomeruli, you can have a minimal tubular interstitial chronicity. So this staging actually pertains only to the glomerular progression of the disease and not to the progression of the disease overall, as you may like. <clears throat> now, this is the typical appearance when you see in the other electron. I was talking about sub-epithelial deposits. So these are the sub-epithelial deposits, which you see the black ones, which are projecting out into the urinary space. And since they are just, the, the, because the target antigen is in the protocyte, the deposits are, getting formed in the subepithelial space. So this is the typical appearance of a membranous pattern glomerular deposition, glomerular disease in a ultrastructural appearance. Now, uh, till 2009, as far as the renal pathologist is concerned, membranous glomerulopathy was the easiest diagnosis. So you just have a case, you see maybe thickened appearing GM, GBMs, you do the IF, you see a nice IgG and you will just sign it out, very happy. So within five minutes, I'll be done with my case. And in this era, apart from the clinically observed association with few systemic diseases like SLE, the nature of immune complexes were elusive. So it's not that people didn't try and understand that whole thing, but it remained elusive at that point of time. So what was happening, uh, what was where we knew the disease associations like hepatitis B or SLE, we would call them secondary membranes and everything else was primary. So this was the concept at this point of time. But what happened in 2009, uh, an interesting paper came out, which identified the M-type phospholipase I2, A2 receptor as a target antigen in idiopathic MJ. And this was a landmark paper in the sense it, it, it opened the gates for understanding of membranous gene. It opened the flood gates actually. So once we identified that membranous uh, nephropathy, that important, the most common target antigen is the M-type phospholipase A2 receptor against which the anti-PLA2 or antibodies are circulating and getting binding bind to the immune complexes, forming the immune complexes, we started to understand what goes on behind formation of these immune complexes. Till this time, we did not know. 
and at that time it was thought that around 80 to 90 percent of cases of uh, membranous gn are associated with uh, phospholipid a2 receptor antibodies which we now we know is not such a high number we we know many other antigens and this percentage has actually reduced it's no more 80 or 90 percent and we probably it's around 60 percent of cases 65 percent which are pla2r positive and uh, what it did in the clinical parlance was now we we, we had an evidence of an anti pla2r antibody probably suggesting an autoimmune kind of a process so we started calling these as primary mgn and rest everything as secondary mgn now uh, even here there was a caveat so we knew about 70 80 percent you probably have another five percent some disease association but we still didn't know anything about 15 or 20 percent of cases so clearly this was not enough so probably clearly pla2r was not the only antigen which was involved in pathogenesis of membranous gene so these are just a few images I, I would like to share about PLA2R staining. So unlike uh, other branches, where do we, this is immunohistochemistry, by the way. So we do immunohistochemistry to stain the PLA2R antigen in biopsy tissue. And those brown staining which you are seeing is the uh, is representative of the antigen-antibody complexes which are formed here. Now, uh, PLA2R or phospholate PA2 receptor is actually present in significant amounts normally in the glomerulus. So it may not form immune complexes in all the cases. So meaning that even if you stay in a non-membranous GN for PLA2R, you would get some staining. The idea here is when you have to understand what is the overexpression of PLA2R. So it comes with experience, it takes time, but uh, it's an important point for beginners to note that even if you're seeing uh, brown staining in a case of uh, some glomerulopathy, it is not membranous. So PLA2R is not used to diagnose membranous GN. It is always used to detect the antigen antibody complexes and a pattern to it will only define whether the staining is significant or not staining. Now from 2009 to 2014 the availability of IHC or most of most some people also used IF for staining of PLA2R helped the clinicians to diagnose and monitor the disease because there was a serological test also available for detecting PLA2 antibodies. This was a huge improvement in the sense you could actually diagnose a case and then monitor it, monitor your treatment and see how well your treatment has done in terms of reducing the uh, circulating autoantibodies. So as I said, PLA2R positive was primary MGN and rest everything was secondary, but this was not enough. In 2014, another antigen called the thrombospondin THSD7A type 1 containing 7A was discovered again. So this was the second antigen to be discovered in 2014. And at that at the time when it was discovered, we thought about 5% of cases were thrombospondin positive, which now we know it is not the case. So actually thrombospondin is very rare. And uh, even in a large center like ours, where we see almost 25,000 biopsies, we don't get more than 8 to 10 positive thrombospondin cases in a year. So it is it is a definitely a very, very uncommon uh, antigen. Nonetheless, it, it told us more about uh, the pathogenesis of membranous GN and we were we started discovering more and more antigens and getting more and more insights into the disease process. So this image is from one of our cases. The pattern of staining remains the same. So we use the ISC staining and try to uh, decipher whether that particular uh, antigen is forming immune complexes in this particular case. Morphology remains the same. There is no difference. Now, what happened beyond this, probably in the last five to six years, there has been an explosion of knowledge in this area. And uh, to the extent that almost six to seven months, you have a new antigen uh, being described, right? So, uh, but that's helped a lot in understanding the whole disease process. So now we know that there are a large number of antigens which are described that includes exostosin 1, exostosin 2, NEL1, which, about which I'll talk in a greater detail because it's a very, very important antigen. Then we, there, there was an intriguing uh, curiosity about children developing membranous nephropathy. So we had no answer that why are, and what is happening to these children, small children, two, three, four, five years of age, developing a disease which is actually more prevalent in the very, very older population. So there was something different in these kids. And we discovered that semaphorin 3B is one of the most important target antigens in pediatric membranous gene. After that, a lot of antigens have been described, the protocadherin 7, the neural cell, the NCAM1, another many other antigens. I'll, I'll enumerate them as we go along. So what I'll do now is I'll quickly uh, take you through a few of the important antigens. I'll stop for a while at NEL1 because it has a very, very interesting and a relevant story behind it. And then we'll, we'll talk about how 
in the clinical parlance, all this explosion of knowledge and all this confusion about antigens, how can we make sense out of it? So exhaustosin associated MGN is a very uh, important development in the whole uh, pathogenesis scenario. Because if you, as a clinician, many of you who be attending this seminar would know that there, there is all, there is in a lot of cases a challenge between diagnosing a membranous GN versus a membranous lupus nephritis. So membranous lupus nephritis may not have all the characteristic clinical features at presentation. And when a biopsy is done, even we are at a loss many times to tell whether this particular disease is actually an autoimmune or lupus associated disease or a conventional membranous GN. So exhaustosin 1 and 2, these are two different antigens but they have a very, very similar immunological profile. So that's why they are often spoken of as together. And in a large number of lupus, non-proliferative lupus cases, especially membranous class 5, you get exhaustosin 1 or 2 staining. So if you have a case where you're not able to decide whether it is a membranous lupus or a membranous GN, and if it is positive for exhaustosin 1 or 2, it, there is a high likelihood that this whole process of membranous GN is autoimmune and a patient is very likely to have an SLE-associated disease in the scenario. So the clinical implication of uh, this uh, discovery of this antigen uh, was that the patients of lupus nephritis or lupus uh, membranous lupus nephritis who have an exhaustosin 1 or 2 positivity actually have better clinical outcomes compared to the exhaustosin 1 or 2 negative membrane. So that's a very important finding here. And uh, there are a lot of studies which are going on right now. So it, it will become imperative. So even if you have a membranous lupus nephritis, the exhaustosin staining can actually serve as a prognostic marker. So going forward, there will be a lot of studies. Uh, probably some of these will also get incorporated into the uh, classification of lupus nephritis. And that is exactly where we are heading going forward. And another important thing, which uh, I think it's at this point only, I should tell everyone that of the 20 odd membranous antigens, which we know now at, till date, exhaustosin 1 and 2 are the only ones which, in which we have not been able to demonstrate circulating autoantibodies. So uh, maybe our detection systems are not that clear. So that the important implication of this point is it will be very difficult in absence of any circulating autoantibody to judge the therapy. So it's, it will be difficult to monitor those cases, unlike other cases. But probably, hopefully, our uh, detection methods become more uh, refined and we are able to detect that because I'm sure there are autoantibodies. So it's only a matter of time that we'll be able to detect them in circulation also. So this is from one of our own cases. So uh, exhaustosin, we do only exhaustosin one. By the way, we are not doing exhaustosin at this point of time. We will soon start doing it. And on a one-to-one um, -one basis, more cases of membranous lupus nephritis show exhaustosin two actually than one. So it's important to include exhaustosin two also in your staining repertoire if you want to do uh, good justice to your cases. I was talking about the childhood membranous nephropathy and this is the antigen. The semaphorin 3B is the antigen which is most prevalent in membranous uh, nephropathy as in children. And uh, in the original cohort where it was described by Dr. Sanjeev Sethi and his group at Mayo Clinic, about 73% of the cases in their original cohort of children had this semaphorin 3B. So we, we do see them in our practice also and a lot of them are actually occurring in children. So it, it's a very important uh, marker to have in your laboratory and antibodies to SEMA3 have been det well detected in uh, patients having membranous GN associated with SEMA3. Now the practical implication uh, of this is now, now since we are uh, diagnosing these cases, we have realized a large number of SEMA4 in 3B associated pediatric MGNs actually have a genetic basis. <laughs> and uh, on the other side of it, a lot of these children who are not biopsied at point of time and are being treated like SRNS, actually have this semaphorin associated membrane as GN. So it's a good idea to biopsy all the SRNS, which I'm sure the pediatric nephrologists are doing now. So this is from one of our own cases. Uh, semaphorin, you can see that glomerulus, which is staining, uh, fine granular staining along the GBMs. And there is no difference in the morphology. Everything looks the same, but it's only the target antigen, which is different in these cases. Another antigen is protocaterin 7. So this is an interesting uh, 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 development. I was, you remember I was talking about C3 staining in membranous GN, right? So around 80 to 85 to maybe 90% of cases do have C3 staining. The moment, if you see a case where there is no C3 staining at all, and this is the antigen you need to look for. So this particular target antigen 
is associated with extremely low levels of complement activation. And in, as a matter of fact, in the we, we've seen a couple of these cases and few of the cases in the original cohort actually had spontaneous resolution of the disease. So not having complement as a part of immune complex disorder is probably a favorable prognostic indicator. And these, these cases follow a very favorable clinical course in long term. And similarly to the exhaustosin 1 and 2, we, we, we've, talk, we've been talking about NCAM1 has been there for some time. So this is called the neural, neural cell addition molecule. And uh, serum from patients who have NCAM1 positive membranous gene, they have circulating autoantibodies. And a few cases of membranous lupus nephritis actually have NCAM1 positive antibodies. So this is another stain which you can use to uh, detect autoimmune autoimmunity associated with membranous gene. And a lot of others have been described with, with time to time. So we have an HTRA1 associated, which uh, there is no real clinical association at this point of time. And these were actually discovered when, when they started uh, doing mass spec staining on uh, the quadruple. So at one point of time, we had only four antigens. So whatever was negative for those four antigens was again subjected to mass spec and other bioinformatic platforms. And this one, was, HTRA1 was uh, discovered. So as we see more and more cases, we will probably start recognizing more and more clinical associations with these target antigens. The first step is conquered. So we now we know the target antigens. Now we just need to collect more cases, see, get more experience to identify the clinical spectrum associated with these. We talked about thrombospondin earlier. And even in the original cohort and even in our experience, a good number of these thrombospondin positive cases have an underlying malignancy. So this is one important development which has happened, happened over the years. And from a pathologist's perspective, there is a, in some cases of thrombospondin, you get a peculiar coarse granular pattern of uh, staining in IgG. So this is what has been described here. I've taken this from Twitter by, from Dr. Siti. We do see this in our practice also once in a while. So instead of that fine granular staining along uh, of IgG along GBNs, sometimes you get this lumpy kind of a staining. So these are few of these thrombospondin positive cases for unknown reasons show this peculiar pattern of IF staining, which is important for pathologists to keep in mind. Now, uh, I'll, I'll stop and uh, for a few slides on N1 associated membranous gene. So this probably has emerged as the star antigen after PLA2R. And uh, now we know that after PLA2R, this is the second most common target antigen membranous gene. And it is even more important in the Indian subcontinent because of uh, the coming slides I'll let you know because of a lot of uh, associations with one peculiar disease, the alternative drug medication and other things which are prevalent in India. Now, from a pathologist's perspective, the very a very striking feature of nl one associated membranous GNS is, is its segmental nature. In the sense, the deposits are not present diffusely throughout the GVMs and they are present only in segmentally. So you have one capillary which will show you some deposits, two, three capillaries, you won't have anything at all. Then in some capillaries, you have few deposits. So that makes the diagnosis even more difficult. And sometimes it's so faint that you, if you don't see it thoroughly, you will just miss it. And these are the cases we call segmental NGN. Segmental NGN has been recognized over the last two or three decades. It's not something new. But now we know that a large number of these segmental NGNs are actually NL1 associated membrane NGN. And if you talk about the so-called primary and secondary spectrums, a term which is now losing its relevance completely, uh, NL1 probably is the most prevalent across both these spectrums. So you will have cases where you, you will be able to pinpoint an etiology and there will be cases where you would be probably calling it a primary NL1 associated membrane as GM. And uh, in the original cohort which was described by Mayo Clinic, uh, a strong emphasis was laid on NL1 being associated with malignancies. So uh, we've had a fair amount of experience. In fact, we, we probably have seen the largest number of NL1 positive cases in the world till date. And, and since we are seeing it in a restricted geographic location, in our experience, the association of NL1 with malignancy is very, very uncommon. And we see a lot of other things with NL1 associated gene, but definitely not malignancy. So the disease association is probably more stronger with thrombospondin rather than NL1 as, to, as far as malignancies are concerned. So we, we, it's a learning curve for all of us. Probably uh, once we see more cases, may, maybe more things will emerge, but this is the situation at this point of time. So this is exactly what I was uh, describing. So the many faces. So NL1 associated membranous GN could be a part of a malignancy. It could have an autoimmune etiology. There are cases described with sarcoidosis, infections, 
even in post transplant i have personally seen a couple of cases post transplant nil1 associated membrane gn some cases of hematopoietic stem cell transplantation drugs indigenous medicine and you name it and you have it so nil1 is probably a most prevalent amongst all these spectrums however one striking thing which has happened in indian subcontinent particularly is the association of nil1 associated membranous gn with and traditional or so called indigenous medications and this is this is a glaring reality which is uh, staring at our face we see it day in day out and to the extent that now when you were you have a nil1 associated membranous gn you should take a very very detailed and probing clinical history of any of such kind of medications and in our cohort of i think we we've seen a very very large number of nil1 cases a great percentage of them actually have revealed some underlying medications i'll come to that in a moment so this was a very fantastic great paper by dr anila korean from chennai who co collaborated with researchers from uh, arcana labs and this is what they came up with so if you see <coughs> patients who were taking traditional medications 90 now only 88% of them were actually nil1 positive that's a huge number and on the other cohort the non traditional medication so called if you want only 5% were nil1 positive so there is a very very clear uh, evidence of contribution of traditional medications in development of nil1 membranous gn so this is one part of it and I, this is just to show you the patterns of staining so you can have a diffuse staining from a very segmental stain it's no different from other forms except probably thrombospondin in some cases but uh, this is more segmental in nature so many cases of nil1 positive uh, gn show show you a very segmental nature of staining of igg in direct immunofluorescence and this is this is how the ihc would appear so if you see the image on the top right so you can see that large number of capillaries are not staining it is only a very few number of capillaries which are staining and this is exactly what the segmental nature of what i was talking about so segmental membranous gn is a very very strong indicator of a nil1 associated membranous gn now uh, as we as we probed harder into our own patients we realized that uh, many patients were taking indig indigenous medications then we the clinicians also identified there was some peculiar clustering of cases within families so when these cases were probed harder a very interesting thing came up so a, lo a lot of these patients were actually using um, face whitening creams and uh, although our name doesn't figure in these two publications both these cases were diagnosed by us and there was a family of three sisters who were using the same face cream and they all three landed up with the same nil1 membranous gn at different points of time very closely temporally very close so that's where the eyes were opened and we realized that it's not just the traditional medications which are responsible but even such peculiar things like face cream so what was in this face cream was the question so why was this uh, association with face cream so important so we realized so once the toxicological studies were done on these cases and this this one this is a circular which has been released by us fda last month and skin products containing mercury and hydroquinone have been delineated by fda and <coughs> excuse me so this is the picture they had come up with so this is not my missing this is an fda warning so they have so they, they they kept a task force which over a period of probably 2 years collected lot of uh, samples of face creams from across the world and then subjected them to analysis toxicological analysis in their us fda approved laboratory and this is what they got so the maximum permissible limit of mercury in these cosmetic formulations is 1 ppm and you just have a look at the amount of ppm of mercury which was in these cases and a large number of these cases you had a membranous gn which was nil1 positive so to the extent of 22000 so where you have an upper permissible limit of 1 ppm some of these creams actually had 22 25000 ppm of mercury and this is the toxicology agent which had a common theme with nil1 associated membranous gn and we are seeing more and more of these cases in our routine clinical practice and interestingly a large number of these creams on the left side have originated from the indian subcontinent that includes india bangladesh pakistan and middle east so a lot of these uh, uh, formulations are originating from this area so so much so about membranous uh, nil1 positive membranous gn so it is the second most common i'll, I'll come to that in a while so our pla2 are probably which account 65% <laughs> about 15% of cases of uh, membranous gn are associated with nil1 positive membranous gn now we were talking about uh, other etiologic agents now 
once we knew how to diagnose these cases. So, uh, by the way, most of these target antigens were uh, discovered using a technology with, in which you dissect out the glomeruli using a laser capture micro dissection. And then you subject the dissected glomerulus to proteomic analysis by mass spectroscopy. So, you have a laser capture micro dissection followed by mass spectroscopic analysis, which enabled identification of all these antigens. And uh, since we started doing it in a lot of cases, we were actually able to discover it with specific diseases also. So this NDNF is one another case where we have a syphilis and I was fortunate to be a part of this discovery cohort in this case. So NDNF, the neuronal neuron derived neurotrophic factor is a specific target antigen for syphilis associated membranous GN. And uh, there was an enigma around membranous GN with NACIDU. So it was kind of an anecdotal with a lot of times so you, you, you have cases of membranous GN. You take a history, the patient has been taking NACIDU for a long time. So now we have actually described and discovered an antigen called the poprotein converted subtilin, the Kexin type, it's a long name, but we can call it PCSK6. And this is a target antigen in NACID associated membranous GN. So now we know so, so what is happening. So we, apart from broad disease associations, we now have target antigens by which we can identify specific diseases per se. So that's a very important advancement which has been made uh, over the years. So this, this paper came out in 2023. And as if this was not enough, a single paper gave seven more antigens. So <laughs> taking the tally to 20. So now we have 20 antigens which have been described. And these seven antigens were described in a single paper. But they use, use a slightly different technology to detect these. So as I told you, laser capture microdissection followed by mass spectroscopy was used for all other antigens. But these seven antigens were discovered using laser capture dissection followed by a protein G immunoprecipitation. So different technology. And these were the seven antigens which were uh, discovered in this particular paper which originated from Arcana Labs in USA. And unfortunately, we, we do not really have a very clear-cut clinical correlate of these antigens as of date. We, we are learning about them and as in when we stain them and detect them more, the clinical associations will become clearer. So uh, our experience, this is a new, uh, we've been doing uh, membranous GN target antigens for a very long time. And we were in fact first in the world to start doing these target antigens on a routine basis. And uh, we, we used we use the panel of five initially. So we used PLA2R, NEL1, thrombosponding, semaphorin, 3B and exostosin 1 for all our membranous GN cases. And we have recently added uh, protocadrin and FAT1 also. <clears throat> so over this time, we have uh, seen approximately 2,500 cases of membranous GN. And PLA2R, of course, is the most common. So we have around 65% cases of PLA2R positive membranous GN, but a very large number of NEL1. So this is much higher than what the Western literature has reported or seen. So we get around 15% uh, positivity rate for NEL1. 15% are actually negative for all targets. So even after doing this uh, five, we've started doing the other two very recently, but there is a big, big cohort, which still we do not know anything about. And all the other antigens put together are approximately 5%. That includes semaphorin. They're very rare, thrombospondin, exhaustus, and other things. And as I told, NEL1 is very versatile. So we, we now have the largest cohort of NEL1 positive membranous genes uh, in the world. And very, very large number of them are associated with indigenous medication use. So probably this percentage is going to remain higher in our geographic areas because of the various practices of medication which we follow. And as a clinician, it is a very, very important thing to take a note of this and probe the patients uh, about what they have been using. So, and as I have... Uh, said earlier so in our cohort of 350 cases the incidence of nel1 associated membranous gn having an underlying malignancy is very low so there are clear geographic differences and as and when more geographic regions start doing and bringing out their data we will probably get more to know about this very very interesting uh, antigenic profile of membranous gn <clears throat> So uh, as I've told, so it's, it's a good recap here. So that now we have disease specific target antigens. The contactic one is associated with demyelinating polyneuropathy. Protocadrin FAT1 is very commonly associated with a post hematopoietic stem cell transplantation NGN. So it's a, so as, as we are doing more bone marrow transplants now, we are also identifying a good number of cases of post stem cell transplantation membranous GN. And a good number of these membranous GNs are actually protocadrin FAT1 associated membranous GN. So we talked about NDNF as a marker for syphilis associated uh, 
MLS GA. And we recently also identified PS, PC, PSCK6 as the target antigen in long-term NSAID use associated cases. So we have very clear clinical correlates of these target antigens also. This is just a stat which is telling you these are the 20 we know as of now. And I'm sure this is going to expand a lot in the years to come. But all this explosion of knowledge also has led to a lot of confusion. So confusion lies both at the end of the pathologist also gets transferred to the clinician because having uh, said everything, even today, we only have two uh, target antigens where we have commercially available uh, antibodies in serum so that you can monitor the disease. So PLATR is the most common. And some centers also do thrombosponding antibodies. And these are the only two ones which are commercially available at this point of time. And by probably June or July, we will also have a commercial assay for NEL1. So that will solve a lot of uh, problem, of course. But from a confusion point of view, how to approach these cases, so there is still a confusion. So there was a confusion because this target antigen was discovered so quickly. There was no time to actually sit back and see how, what is the exact clinical picture in which we want to fit in and help the clinician. So most of these antigens were discovered by Mayo Clinic and it was natural that they need to come up with a consensus report on this to clear the confusion. So recently, I think in November only it came out. So this was a paper which was published simultaneously in Kidney International and Mayo Clinic Proceedings. It was a multi-institutional study in which there was a, con this is a consensus report on membranous nephropathy and they have a novel classification. So this, this is a unique classification in the sense it does not classify as stages or something else. It, it's a more of a diagnostic uh, guide, a classification as a diagnostic guide. And in, in this is from that particular paper. You can see PLA2R uh, is 55%. And from the original, even they have now gone up to 10%, which is even higher in our cohort for NEL1. And rest of the other antigens are very, very uncommon. Nonetheless, you keep them seeing sporadically once in a while. <clears throat> and I was, as I was talking about exhaustosin 2, if you may recall, I, I told you about this is the only antigens where we have not been able to detect circulating autoantibodies. But the good news is that in a vast majority of others, we have circulating autoantibodies and it is only a matter of time that commercial assays for monitoring of these particular antigens will become available. So right now we have PLA2R, thrombosponding, we will soon have NEL1. And as we progress further in this field, you will have assays, serological assays, so that once your diagnosis of a particular target antigen associated membranous gene is made, there is also an avenue to follow up these patients with the serological levels, which is very, very crucial going forward if you were actually want to help these patients. <clears throat> so this is the classification which Moye Clonic has proposed. So <clears throat> what it does, it does is a two-step uh, classification in the sense the first part the first step is always the identification of the antigen so you have a biopsy you do the immunostaining and then you identify these antigens so depending on what antigen you have identified the second step would involve identifying the disease association if present so if you have a PLA2R you really don't have a clear cut so you call it primary if you want to call it but when you have a NEL1 you have to go deeper and try to see whether the patient has an underlying malignancy or is he taking some drug or is he using a face cream or if the patient is having some underlying autoimmune disease. Thrombospondin, whenever it comes, you need to do a more than intense survey for underlying malignancy. There are many, as I told earlier, do not have clinical correlates at this point of time. But as we see more and more cases, we will definitely be able to see them. So we have CMF4 and 3B for pediatric patients. We have exhaustosin 1 and 2 for autoimmune diseases. We have contactin 1 for the CIPD associated membranous GN. The transforming goat factor beta and cam one again are autoimmune associated markers. You have NDNF for syphilis. We have FAT1 for hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. And we also have PCSK6 for NSAID. So we see we, we've gone quite far here. It's not that the confusion has cleared up significantly. And now we know how to proceed in a given case, at least to some extent. And as far as a pathologist is concerned, <clears throat> we actually uh, see it's not possible to stain all the antigens in a biopsy. It is just not feasible. So even if there are 50 antigens or 20 antigens, it's not possible for us to stain everything at go. Biopsy is very small. We'll end up the entire core just staining. So we need to find a logical way of doing it. So the most logical way of doing it is to first stain for the antigens which are most common. So we first stain for PLA2R and NEL1. So that covers around 70 to 80% of our cases. And then if these two are negative, then we go on staining for other things. 
that will be guided by the disease question sometimes. So if you have a clear cut case of a hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, the third antigen which I am going to put up is going to be uh, uh, THS, this thing. Uh, what do you call that? What was fat one? So this is how we are going. So and if the patient is CIPD, I'll put up the uh, contact in one. So this is how we will approach instead of putting everything together at once. And uh, this will solve a lot of problems going forward. The only thing that repertoire has to be available at that particular institute. And having said that, so it's not only the pathology which will clinch the diagnosis. So it is. it will always be serology, pathology, the patient demographics, the medicine supplemental use clinical disease associations and imaging workup of malignancy, which will actually help you to categorize a particular patient of membranous GM with respect to its target antigen. So the approach as per my experience also, and as per the consensus classification also, would be two prongs. So either you approach it as an antigen associated membranous GM where you first look for the antigen and then you go forward, depending on what you get and then you decide clinically and other things. The second is when you have an upfront type of disease in which an association is there, it will be a directed study thereafter. So if you have a specific disease like HSCT, you just go do, go ahead and do a FAT1, the protocarrarian FAT1. Or if the patient has syphilis, we will just do an NDINF1. So this is how you should ideally proceed in case. And these are the two approaches which will give you the best results in the shortest time instead of going all and all out against in all the cases. And as you must have realized by this time, so there is there is a big gray zone still there. So there is a large group of around 10 to 20 percent cases which are negative for all known antigens. So all these 20 are negative in those cases. And among the one of the first membranous GN disease associations was hepatitis B. All of us know that. But we still do not know what is the target antigen in hepatitis B associated function. So there's a lot of work going on in that also. But this is one gray area which we need to cover. And this problem of membranous lupus versus membranous lupus nephritis versus membranous GN is still there. We do not have a single answer to this uh, problem. And a very, very important uh, question is the post-transplant MGN of which about we, the pathogenesis of which we are completely clueless about at this point of time. So these cases are negative for all known target antigens and probably have an alloimmune kind of a morphology and the target antigen is yet elusive in these cases. So what is the way forward? So this is the last slide of my presentation today. So what is the way forward? So probably we know that. So I have seen the original uh, cohort of the, in that spectra and there is a very, very large number of antigens which you find in these deposits. So these are the ones which have clinical associations and are above the threshold for importance. But there are other antigens which we will eventually discover and the list is going to increase. And as I have told, the serological testing for more antibodies will be available soon. So that what it will help in the clinical follow-up and assess the response to treatments going forward. This is a very, very important area which we would want to develop into. And do the laboratories keep on adding markers to their menu? It's a very tricky question in the sense uh, as it is very difficult both as a commercial entity or even if it is not a commercial entity, if, even if it's government hospital which can add, it is a very, very difficult thing to keep on doing all these things, right? It's very difficult. So, so it is probably possible up to 10, maximum 12, but the moment it goes above that, you become impractical, even from a practical point of view in the sense, it is a limited tissue available. So you can't actually put up all the antigens they want. So what I suspect, uh, what I hope in going forward and in the coming decade, five or 10 years, so laser capture microdissection followed by mass spectroscopy actually would become the method of choice in those cases which are PLA2R and L1 negative. So once you have a PLA2R and L1 negative membranous GN, so you fall in that uh, bracket of around 20 to 30 percent of cases, and it, it will not be a bad choice, depending on how widely these techniques become available, to fall back on this technique to make a get diagnosis instead of wasting our time in trying out antigens after antigens and all that. So this is what I think is we are heading to, and this is where the whole scenario of membranous nephropathy is currently in the scenario now. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. In, it was indeed a very in-depth uh, discussion on uh, membranous uh, nephropathy antigens. In fact, uh, we are over, uh, if crossed the time limit, but then the talk was so good that I didn't want to interrupt. Um, so there are a lot of questions for you uh, in the YouTube chat box. I'd request you to uh, go through them. 
because uh, we'll now go on towards the panel discussion okay thank you sir thank you, thank you. so moving on to the next segment uh, we'll uh, head towards the panel discussion amongst three nephrologists um, just uh, we have uh, uh, dr suhas bavikar from aurangabad uh, dr p s walli from hyderabad and dr amit langote sir from uh, mumbai uh, they are uh, practicing nephrologists uh, and uh, they have a wide clinical experience regarding membranous nephropathy so my first question is to amit sir dr amit sir um so what is your approach in a suspected case of membranous nephropathy uh, do you start steroids um, while you wait for the biopsy report or you continue with supportive therapy so like uh, the approach for membranous nephropathy is uh, probably the same that i have for any other gn with nephrotic range proteinuria uh, I would uh, obviously send the GN markers, make sure the GN markers are either PLA2 or positive or negative. And if they're positive, I would uh, look at what is the clinical scenario of this patient? What is the biopsy finding? I have, uh, uh, after the detection of PLA2R, I have not necessarily done biopsy in every uh, patient who has a PLA2R positive. Unless they have a nephrotic syndrome of 8 to 10 grams with albumin less than 2.5, severe edema, anasarca, or a rising creatinine. In these situations, uh, I would definitely, after the initial treatment biopsy, maybe give them steroids. But I would still wait for biopsy findings to confirm the diagnosis and then proceed with any immunosuppression. If there is a plateau positive, if uh, I would look for any other possibility of malignancy or no. If their malignancy is detected, then you would go along that lines. But if their malignancy is not detected, then you would wait and decide on clinical parameters. And the three clinical parameters I use is the severity of nephrotic syndromes, the proteinuria levels, uh, 8 to 10 grams and above, the decline in GFR, and creatinine, if that's high or low. So I do not start steroids initially upfront. I would start with uh, the RAS blockers, supportive treatment for edema, anti-edema measures, and blood pressure control if required, diuretics as and how required. Uh, and then based on the biopsy confirmation, I uh, would proceed with further treatment. If the plateau are are positive, then obviously you decide what sort of immunosuppression you want to give. And I guess we will discuss that in the part three of the section in terms of what treatment protocols we use. So, uh, uh, diagnosing the disease and the treatment are uh, do cost a lot. So, do you routinely uh, screen for malignancy in all cases? Because there's a wide range of tests that we need to describe. To so, uh, so Purva, uh, I am a firm believer that you spend enough so that you are satisfied and confirmed that you've not missed anything. Mm -hmm. I have prevented and have, have burned my hands by not doing enough investigations in my formative practice years and realized that something that I could have picked up, I didn't pick up. Uh, I do not restrict my practice based on the cost, though obviously I try to ensure that I use the right tests and minimize the cost, but mm -hmm. I would do the necessary tests to, you know, you're giving immunosuppression to somebody uh, whom you do not know or have a suspicion for malignancy or uh, you know so many times you will find an uh, M band somewhere or you will find a uh, couple at, uh, I mean, you may do just SPEP and you've not done a free light chain and you will find that the free light chains were later on positive. So, you know, uh, some of these things, some lymph nodes here and there, somewhere in thyroid, somewhere in prostate. So I don't do all of these tests, but I would do a PET scan starting and if I find something on a PET scan, I would proceed further, especially when looking for a malignancy. But I do uh, do a PET scan if I'm suspecting a malignancy. That's where I start from. And if I pick up something which is significant, I would investigate in that focused area so that I don't do all the CTs from head, neck, chest, you know, pelvis. I start with a PET scan. Again, that's uh, that will uh, not allow me to look in the brain, the heart, and the liver, because these are highly um, areas which have high metabolic uptake. But all other malignancies, probably we can pick up on a PET scan. Right. 
I sir, I do have a few more questions, but then I'll go on to the next one. Um, maybe we'll take up uh, in the chat box. Uh, sure. With the gamut of uh, treatment protocols like uh, modified Ponticelli, uh, Dituximab, and CNIs with steroids, uh, which treatment protocol have has worked for you in your clinical practice? So, uh, Dr. Alok has beautifully put up so many things, and I think we recently had a debate at uh, uh, West Zone, ISN West Zone, where uh, these protocols were discussed, and we debated. I was on the in favor of Rituximab and. Uh, Dr. Vilas Naik was in favor of Ponticelli regimen. Uh, so I think in terms of efficacy, it's proven that Ponticelli is the best in terms of efficacy. Having said that, in the recent years of Rituximab era, we have proven enough evidence pro to prove that Rituximab is equally efficacious to Ponticelli. Except in organ threatening situation, like when there is rapidly declining GFR, high creatine, etc., where we are not, uh, where we would probably favor more Ponticelli. In my personal experiences, I have and I was using Ponticelli initially, but uh, given this upcoming evidence with Rituximab, I have recently, uh, in the last year or so, switched over to Rituximab. We know Rituximab takes time to show the effects. And most of the trials that I've done are short-term trials, 6 to 12 months, rarely 24 months follow-ups. In those trials, you do not have time to pick up the side effects of malignancies that you would see with Ponticelli. Mm -hmm. We know Ponticelli has a lot of side effects and Rituximab is costly compared to Ponticelli. I have seen a lot of infections in my patients when I've used Ponticelli. So I have switched over to Rituximab very honestly, unless it's an organ-threatening situation. The cost, I think, in the longer run, and you will find lots of evidence pro and against, and I know there are lots of ways to circumvent how to reduce the cost with Rituximab uh, by buying it directly outright and you know giving it to the patient or your pharmacy may or pharm uh, the, the companies could support. But from being a Ponticelli guy, I have in the last year moved to uh, Rituximab for sure, predominantly because I find Rituximab equally efficacious and side effects are definitely lesser. Sir, how, what is the dose you're using for Rituximab? So I use uh, two doses of uh, one gram 15 days apart and then I would wait and top it up at six months if I do not find an adequate response. Sir, in the meantime, when you give Rituximab and there is proteinuria, which is probably massive proteinuria, how do you... Uh, like? What do you do? Because that proteinuria disturbs the patient a lot. So Yes. So ACE, ARBs will remain your mainstay along with symptomatic, like any other nephrotic syndrome that you would do. You know, you would treat like any other nephrotic syndrome. Uh, ACE, ARBs, diuretic, salt water restrictions remain the mainstay. But people who have florid life-threatening uh, nephrotic syndrome or similar situations, then that is the case where I would probably use uh, uh, Ponticelli instead of uh, rituximab because rituximab has a latent period before which the action doesn't come up and then sometimes when you do not have that much of time then you would want to use a ponticelli regimen thank you sir uh, we'll move on to our uh, next uh, speaker uh, panelist uh, dr suhas bavikar uh, sir how do you approach uh, patients with membranous nephropathy uh, whom you have immunosuppressed but continue to have proteinuria yeah, the <clears throat> am I see? Uh, yes. Yes. Oh, no. Yeah, now you are. Yeah. yeah. Basically, as uh, Amit has said, the anti proteinuric cocktail which we used to give, AC inhibitors, ARBs, and now almost there are four receptor blockers and three enzyme blockers at our help uh, ARB, MRA. And VRB and then ERA, endothelin receptor antagonist, and then there's DPP4 inhibitors and HMG CoA uh, and ACE inhibitors. All these seven drugs are at the uh, at our disposal as antiproteinuric cocktail. So uh, immunosuppression keep on increasing uh, the dose is not a good uh, practice for a Person, membranous nephropathy invariably, there is a rule of third. Third, one third patients will remit on their own. In my 
uh, nephrology early days, we were we used to be taught like uh, it's an immune complex disease, hemon nephritis or nephropathy, and antigen antibody equilibrium, antigen excess and antibody excess. That was the logic taught to us in, in our student days. So if any immune complex disease antigen is depleted, the immune complex disease improves or remits. If antibody is depleted by your immune suppression, again, the disease disappears, antigen remaining wherever it is. So this antigen depletion or antibody depletion logic was during, uh, was our mainstay in our student days. So with that, we used to uh, treat with antibody. Basically, we could not fix antigens as uh, Dr. Alok Sharma has recently taught to us. And we used to uh, check for anti O, ANA, and uh, many different uh, tests which we used to do. And then give antibiotics and uh, wait for, say, two, three weeks to uh, convert that fellow into antigen depleted state and then re remission. That was our logic in our early days of my nephrology practice. So currently, if antigen is positive, detected as PLAT2 receptor antibody positive or NEL1, this is quite frequent. A lot of cases uh, nowadays are de getting detected. So in those cases, if nephrotic state persists, then this, uh, I keep adding seven antiproteinuric drug cocktail, whichever suits the patient. Bocenta nowadays uh, we have started using. And then, uh, of course, cortisol regime remains the mainstay of therapy for those. And then recently, we had a discussion on combining rituximab and ponticelli in reduced dosages. Will that help or will that make a difference in a resistant uh, nephrotic state case? So that was my take. Sir, uh, what is your opinion uh, regarding the use of mycophenolate in patients with membranous nephropathy? In membranous nephropathy, where the childbearing females or young uh, children, where we are worried about their fertility, testes, or ovarian function later, we were afraid early in using chlorambucil or endoxan. So the uh, these two alkylating or cytotoxic drugs in Ponticelli were replaced by mycophenolate, and uh, to our uh, surprise, many cases do respond as they do respond to chlorambucil. So mycophenolate is a good replacement. Then they also this TAC or cy cyclosporine uh, replacement with steroids was uh, though in, it was practiced in some of the cases where uh, Ponticelli failed. So, but uh, do you think then that if modified Ponticelli is um, uh, endoxan and uh, steroid on alternate uh, months, are you replacing endoxan with uh, mycophenolate and then using it uh, as the yes state? yes yes see endoxan is a drug uh, which is really um, uh, blamed and truly that happens really because the female who is pulsed with endoxan or given endoxan more than say 180 milligrams uh, the this thing will lose the fertility and then even she'll lose premature menopause. So it's really a terrible drug for a disease uh, in a uh, childbearing age of uh, children. So we should really seriously consider on mycophenolate rather than this uh, chlorambucil or endoxan, where it is, unless it is life threatening, particularly when somebody has crescentic GN, uh, I would say mycophenolate. Uh, should be given a second choice. Right. Sir, in your experience, uh, do you decide the treatment protocol uh, based on uh, newer antigens like uh, what Alok Sharma sir said? Or does like will you apply modified Ponticelli or rituximab for all the cases in, irrespective of the antigen? I really wonder what's the point in fixing the antigen when so many of antigens are responsible for generating antibodies. Basically, is it the uh, fixing the antigen will help or uh, because we cannot control these antigens 
phospholipase A2 receptors, we cannot control or deplete them. Or say there are so many antigens which are being labeled or detected. So the mainstay of therapy is reducing antibody titers. So what's the point in checking for so many antigens, spending on staining and laser uh, micro dissection and then mass spectroscopy, unless we can reduce those antigen levels in the immune complex scenario. That was my question to Dr. Alok Sharma. Uh, but then, sir, the thing is that the rule of one third is probably there since a long time. But there is a probability that when you find these antigens, you might be able to uh, have newer treatment modalities that will help reduce these antigens, which may have a, a progress aggressive. So we, uh, reduce, we reduce antibodies, not antigens. Right. But is it, we still have to find out from Dr. Arup Sharma if a particular antigen has an aggressive course in the nephrotic uh, syndrome uh, uh, spectrum or uh, another antigen which is lesser aggressive than the other one. Is is the is this possible? Have you so seen? Let's let's more? hear it from Dr. Alok Sharma. Yeah. So uh, is, he, is he on the line? Yeah, I'm I'm around, sir. So in in my opinion, the idea of doing target antigens is uh, uh, currently to identify the disease associations. So for example, if you have for example, if you have a syphilis, right? So in cases where you have syphilis as the target antigen, uh, the disease. Treating it would reduce the antibodies also. Of course, the ultimate aim would remain to reduce the antibodies. And that is the reason we need a so lot of serological that, assays for so that. I, I agree, sir. But that will restrict to only those cases where infection is cause of MGN. Yeah. Majority absolutely. of these cases are autoimmune. And you don't have any control on antigen titers in those autoimmune cases. Yeah. So autoimmunity is induced. So autoimmunity is only a downstream effect of the infection. Or whatever the maybe it may be a malignancy, maybe a face cream or something, whatever. So even in these cases, few of these cases where face creams are implicated in L1, once the patients have stopped using it and the half or left the of the mercury has reduced, there is actually some regression of the disease. Secondly, in the, I talked about PCDH7 associated cases. There have been cases where there have been spontaneous remission. So what eventually will happen? We will probably identify more and more disease associations with specific antigens, that is where the, and once we have serological markers for a good number of them, we will be actually able to monitor them in a better way. So yeah, monitoring, going, yeah, I agree. Yes. Okay. So going forward, that is the, probably the treatment for a good number of time would remain probably the same. The treatment protocols would not uh, drastically different, but how you follow up these patients would differ depending on what target antigen and underlying disease they have. I think probably that is where we are heading currently. Purva, can I just agree? Yes. yes, sir. So I think I agree with Dr. Alok Sharma, sir. I think uh, I I have two nail cases which is diagnosed in his lab. And uh, both one was a young girl, of course, uh, as soon as it came as nail, we asked for the face cream. The other one was a 53 year old uh, gentleman. Um, and uh, this was a very afterthought when I when it came as nail, I first screened for malignancy. I didn't bother asking about a face cream, but you know, at one of those meets, I was just thinking, and I just asked him, and he also happened to use a face cream, which was, and both these face creams were given by either the beauticians or the barbers. And if you see the barber, the hair cutting saloon barbers, they sell their proprietary products prepared at home from you know generations, which use mercury because it inhibits the melanocytes. But in both these cases, I have not put these patients on any immunosuppression. ACRBs take away the I have checked the serum mercury levels, both are significantly high levels. And both uh, from six months on uh, follow-up, uh, they have a reducing trend for proteinuria. So I think there is some help in knowing the antigen from sometimes that could give you the diagnosis as to or the etiological diagnosis. And maybe in these situations, like these peculiar situations, you may avoid using immunosuppressions and take away the inciting agent that's causing this whole problem. Right. Sir, have you seen any coexistence of uh, coexisting uh, two antigens in one case or? Just... Yeah, so that, that's a very important, good question to I think somebody asked it in the chat also. So uh, as far as the fidelity of these antigens, it's very high. So even in those cases where people have actually described two antigens, it's more of a diagnostic error than two antigens being present. So because when actually 
in these cases where you have when the mass spectroscopy have been run on these so called dual positive on ihc it has only one antigen which has surfaced so there is a very high fidelity of antigenic expression and in my personal opinion i don't think so there is any true dual positivity of target antigen it is one antigen which is dominant and responsible for the disease okay we'll move on to our next uh, panelist mm -hmm. Uh, Dr. P. S. Valli, sir. Yes. Uh, sir, in uh, clinical practice after starting treatment, what is your clinical experience in terms of reduction in proteinuria with uh, various protocols available? Like, what is obviously, the time? Uh, obviously, in our training days, there was no map. We used to depend only on uh, pandicell regimen. But okay. even today, also, we feel that pandicell regimen gives the best possible protein reduction. However, in this era, Probably we are testing our water speed reduction map. It all depends on your uh, PLAR2 antibody levels. If PLAR2 antibodies levels are very high, the reduction map is going to work much better than uh, Pandicelli regimen. Therefore, the straightforward answer for your question is the best regimen which produces immediate results is probably Pandicelli regimen. However, when compared with the risk versus benefit ratio, reduction map offers a majority of benefits when compared to uh, Pandicelli regimen. Therefore, uh, I, my heart lies with rituximab, though uh, the answer for your question is uh, nothing but uh, punishment regimen. Right. So, so uh, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, sir. So, basically, nowadays we need to reframe the question because uh, now the starting point is risk stratification to what strata our patient is belonging to. Therefore, it's not the question of the protein reduction, but how we balance between side effects and the therapeutic efficacy. Therefore, in that way, even though the response with the uh, Pandicell regimen is robust, still we need to opt for rituximab because uh, Pandicell, as you know, very well, it's a toxic regimen. And we are scared to use in this era. And if you look back, we are surprised how, how much dare we are having in our tiny days to use uh, Pandicell for every, every person. Right. So then, sir, what I mean, is, is it pretty much obvious that you're using, uh, you vouch for modified Pandicell or... You still, no, I, I, I watch for 100% for uh, rituximab. I try to find reasons whether to keep the patient as an aggravated therapy. If at all I'm choosing in them for uh, immunosuppressive therapy, I choose none other than rituximab. However, in those patients with rapidly falling GFR or those patients who present with crescentic form of uh, membranous nephropathy, for them there is no other option. The only treatment is Pardicell. Therefore, nowadays, if I use treatment for at least 10 patients of uh, for membranous nephropathy, Nine out of uh, ten will be on rituximab only. Has it have ever happened that uh, despite of giving rituximab, despite of giving rituximab, uh, you have so, uh, 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 also attempted to give another immunosuppression because uh, proteinuria is not coming down or any of. Uh, yeah, in those patients, I follow Starman trial. The Starman trial says that. Uh, after giving rituximab, if at all you feel that patient is not having that much amount of satisfied reduction, you can add a small dose of tacrolimus. So for such patients, what I do is I give one dose of rituximab every yearly, and then I do it in with a small dose of tacrolimus, especially at the dose of 0 0.05 mg per kg body weight. Right, right. So, uh, sir, uh, my last question is, uh, what is your approach to transplanting cases with uh, native kidney disease of uh, membranous nephropathy? And uh, because Platuar is, as sir mentioned, it's just in the 60% cases, do you think doing uh, pre-transplant Platuar is, uh, should be the dictum or algorithm we should follow? Probably for all legal reasons, we should resort to testing uh, Platuar antibodies without, before going to transplantation. But once a patient of membrane nephropathy is on dialysis, that's what the literature also says, even my observations also says that PLAR2 antibodies surprisingly become negative within six months of uh, starting maintenance hemodialysis. However, we are bound to test for uh, PLAR2 antibody levels or any of the newer antigens suspected we are having before going for transplantation, at least to make sure that we have documented a negative PLAR2. Here lies the catch. We are looking only for talking about PLAR2 antibodies, but the patient may be having membrane nephropathy because of any other antigens are the antigens which are potentially being discovered. Therefore, at least for legal purpose, we need to do active antibodies, but that, that does not hinder us from going ahead with transplantation. So, sir, do you uh, say have, a, have a change in the induction protocol or it, it is everything is the same? Uh, no, more literature available in this regard, essentially elaborately, probably uh, just we need to go ahead with the same amount of uh, induction. 
Okay. Thank you, sir. Um, so with that, uh, we come to a, a very interesting uh, discussion on membranous nephropathy. I think if we have, um, there will be a lot of questions. So, uh, in, in case of any further questions, we can have them on the chat box and then I can reach out to our panelists and uh, Dr. Alok Sharma, sir. And uh, we'll be happy to take any questions afterwards. Uh, thank you all. And uh, it has been a great discussion. So we'll end the meeting here. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. And good night. Thank you. Thank you, sir.